Hey, I'm Tad, the associate pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. Good morning, everybody. It is good to see you at the Lord's house this morning as we celebrate and worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're glad to have you. If you're a guest with us, we'd love for you to take the tear tab in your worship guide and uh, put your name and contact information on it. You can drop it in the offering box as you leave or hand it to me as you leave. And I'd be happy to check up on you, visit with you, check on you as you, uh, as you uh, about your experience, your worship experience today at Wilkesboro Baptist Church. If you're interested in serving with us on some mission trips, we've got two coming up in September. One to El Salvador, uh, working with Lored, one of our mission partners. Another to Guatemala, working with Roger and Vicki Grossman, again, mission partners. Pastor Tad and I would be happy to talk with you about either of those mission trips if you're interested in that. For those of you that are students, our youth, our high schoolers are headed to New York on a mission trip uh, this summer, and uh, they're actually going to start their mission trip training tonight uh, at their at their gathered youth time. So you pray for them, pray for the mission trips coming up, and uh, we're going to ask if you would to stand with us as we begin our worship service with a reading from Scripture. This comes from Exodus 19, a text that is alluded to in our passage of Scripture uh, in just a little bit in Hebrews chapter 12. So it begins this way, On the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. It's who we are, and that's why we worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. The Lord God is in our midst, a mighty one to save. He is our strength and our song. He gives us victory. Join us as we declare his greatness with the song, Great in Power. Let's sing. Prince of new heavens and all that's above.
tongue of a powerful and holy God. The holiness of God should stir our hearts to continual praise and adoration. We delight in Him, for in Him is our ultimate purpose and reason for being. Sing this song.
You may be seated. Our memory verse for this month is Hebrews 12, 2. If you wouldn't mind, look on the screen in front of you or in the worship guide and uh, read this verse along with me. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was said before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. If you are not in a Sunday school class, let me encourage you to find and connect with a group of people. Uh, part of the reason that we are a gathered body of believers is to grow closer in community with one another. And Sunday school, class, Sunday school classes are a way to do that. Our class of the week that we're acknowledging and praying for is a class taught by Alan Jones and Peter Schmitz, the Truth and Grace class that meets at 8.30 in classroom 114. I want you to pray for our mission partners, uh, Adam and Ruth Huntley. Sir, they serve as Wycliffe Bible translators. Friends of mine, we went to college and, and seminary together. Uh, and Adam and Ruth are translating scriptures into the language of people of Africa. And so we're grateful for the work that they're doing. And we're going to pray that the, the word that they're translating would be powerful to save those that read it. And then our unreached people group are the Tamil peoples of southern India. Join with me in a time of prayer as we continue in our worship today. Our Father, we have lifted our voices to you in song, acknowledging your greatness and your holiness. And Lord, we uh, admit that if we're honest with ourselves, the vision that we have of you, the impressions that we get of you, fall staggeringly short of who you really are. You are holy, you are great, but even beyond our imagination. Lord, where our ideas of you are shaped by our own perspectives or shaped by things that are not not true, we ask that you forgive us. Lord God, where we limit our obedience to you because of things that we don't want to do, we ask that you forgive us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that this day in this worship gathering, you would open our eyes to see the truth of your greatness and your majesty and your glory. We pray that as we see you rightly, as we see you from the pages and lens of Scripture, we pray, Lord Jesus, that we would not be the same. So we see you as the consuming fire of Hebrews 12. We pray, Lord, that you would burn away the selfishness and self-centeredness that permeates so much of our lives and choices. We pray that you would show us our need to repent of sins that we're holding on to, things we're not doing that we should or things that we're doing that we shouldn't. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to hear your word and respond to you in obedience and surrender. Lord God, we come to you this day thanking you that you spread the glory of your name and you spread the gospel of your kingdom far beyond our reach and far beyond even this gathered worship. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would send missionaries and witnesses to the Tamil people group and Lord, that they would hear the good news of your son Jesus and become followers of you and be represented in that worship gathering there in Revelation chapter 5 when people of all nations, tribes and tongues gather to worship you. Father, we pray that you bless Adam and Ruth in their ministry of translating the scripture into the languages there in Africa and we pray that the scripture translated would be powerful to bring salvation to those who read it and those who declare it. Lord, we pray for Alan and Peter and the Uh, The class that they teach every week, bless them as they gather and study your word, deepen their understanding of you and their relationship with you as Christ followers. Lord God, as we continue in our worship service this day, we, we know there are those in our midst who need your encouragement, and we pray that the truth of your kingship and your sovereign reign would do just that in our hearts and lives. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would teach us from your word and help us not be the same pray this in Christ's name, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We invite you now to stand as you're able and sing with us this prayer. Savior, 
like a shepherd lead us. Shall we stand? seated. The next song we're going to sing, A Mighty Fortress, is an adaptation of the song we know, Martin Luther's hymn, that's of the similar title. This new version, though, speaks to our relationship to God in today's times. But God has not changed, and he will not change. He remains our holy, sovereign, unshakable king, reigning today over us. He is our only righteous judge. And while the evil one sins attacks every day, he is steadfastly looking out for us and protecting us. In these verses, we're reminded to keep our eyes on him and to set our hearts on him. Our God is 
It's a beautiful song that connects directly to the text we're going to read from. This morning we're in Hebrews chapter 12. We'll begin reading in just a moment from verse 18. We'll read through the end of the chapter. I have uh, come to deeply love the book of Hebrews. Not that I didn't before, but I've never had the chance to spend the time in study and research and uh, in prayer and preparation in this wonderful book. And I've grown to deeply love the argument of the book. How the writer wants his readers to not fall away, not look back. They've come to Christ, they have trusted in Jesus as their Savior, yet their temptation facing persecution was to go back and observe patterns of behavior, Old Testament practices that, that would maybe keep them a little bit secure from the persecution that was coming their way. That's not our temptation. I don't think many of us, if any of us, at all have ever been tempted to go back and live according to the Old Testament law. Our our challenge is not to go back and and follow the the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy for our Christian religious practice and patterns. It's not our temptation. I think our temptation today is to see God for less than who He is. I think our temptation is to miss the God that is revealed to us in Scripture for a God that we kind of make up in our own minds. Theological liberals have done this for the last couple of centuries. They have built an image of Jesus that looks a lot like them. He's a person who is for social justice and for kindness, but not really the Jesus who would challenge the religious expressions of the day. There are many people throughout our own context who use language like this. They refer to God as... The man upstairs, which I'll be honest with you, I can't. I, I hate that terminology. It kind of brings God down to our le- level, condescends Him in a way that is not clear in Scripture, and just don't like that terminology. It make, makes God a lot more like us. Sometimes our vision of God is a lot more like a uh, Greek deity, like uh, Zeus, for for example. We imagine God to be sitting in heaven with a lightning bolt, ready to zap anybody who disobeys Him. That's not the God of Scripture. Or or maybe our God is a little bit kinder. Maybe we imagine him to be a grandfather sitting in a rocking chair, a tad bit senile with white hair, who just wants us to crawl up in his lap and he'll rock with us. Folks, the Bible doesn't describe God in any of those pictures or images. The Bible gives us a viewpoint of God that is far more glorious and distinct than anything we could ever imagine. Even today in our contemporary experience, we have people on kind of the theological left of Christianity who imagine Jesus as someone who is welcoming and affirming of every identity and every behavior and every thought process. And he's just here to welcome everybody just as they are and not change anything about them and not call out any sin in their life. And that's happening in churches all across our land for those who are liberally Christian. But some of us as conservative Christians imagine Jesus wearing a MAGA hat telling us to build a wall. Folks, Jesus is not in any of those scenarios and he is far greater and more glorious than any of those images that we might have or express. If I could get us to do one thing, and I've been burdened about this all week as I've been studying this text, if I could get us to do anything today, it would be to see God for who he really is. And this passage of Scripture in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 gives us a picture and a viewpoint of God that is far greater and far more glorious than any imagination we may have. Read with me if you will. Hebrews 12, beginning in verse 18. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest, And the sound of a trumpet and a a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages would be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, to the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, 
and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens." This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us thus offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. What we see in this text of Scripture is a beautiful kind of connection of the gospel and the applications of the gospel. In the first paragraph that we read, the writer explains some things about how we've come to God through Christ. In the second paragraph, he exhorts us. He applies what he's explained and helps us understand and make sense of it. So what, what are the explanations that we need to understand? The first explanation, folks, is we need to see God for who he is. God is glorious and terrifying and holy and righteous. In, in the first paragraph, verse 18, he said, you have not come to what may be touched. In verse 22, but you have come in this way. So what he's doing, he's giving us a picture. He's giving us some imagery that helps us understand who God is and how we come to God. The first picture there is the picture of the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. A few weeks after they came out of Egypt... And came to the mountain. This is the place, Exodus 20, where Moses received the Ten Commandments. It's the place where they spent weeks there as God gave Moses instructions not only about the law, but about how the tabernacle was to be constructed. All of that took place at Mount Sinai. But that original event at Mount Sinai was quite staggering in its experience. I would encourage you in your own time to go back and read all of Exodus 19. Read what took place in that moment. Notice the text and how it describes it. He says, you have not come. This is not the way you've come. You've not come this way to Mount Sinai. You've not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire, darkness, gloom, and a tempest, the sound of a trumpet, a, a, a voice whose words made the hearers beg, don't say anything else to us. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, the sight was so terrifying that even Moses said, I tremble with fear. What took place? Well, what happened is the people of Israel had received rescue from the people of Egypt. or from Egypt. They had come through the, the waters of the Red Sea on dry land. They made it all the way to Mount Sinai. At the mountain, God said this to Moses. He said, consecrate the people. They need to remain holy and clean for three days. They don't need to come up on the mountain because I'm going to show up in my glory on the mountain. And when I show up in my glorious holiness on the mountain, don't let any beast, don't let any person get near the mountain. Because if they do, they need to be stoned or shot and left there, not touching them, staying away from them because they have stepped into my holy presence. What took place in that moment on the mountain is that God came down in glory and in fire. He came down and the top of the mountain was in fire. There was a great tempest. There were storm clouds. There were lightnings. There were thunders. And it shook the people. Now, some of you this week are going to do some race activities. Maybe you've already been to the race. Our family's not going to the race this week. But we went to the parade on, on Friday. Was it Friday? Friday, Friday evening, we went to the parade downtown, and those big hauler trucks came by, and, and they, we felt them. I mean, it wasn't just that they drove by, they blared their horns, and I shook. I mean, it shook us from the inside, right? Some of you have been to the racetrack, and it's not just that you hear the cars going by, you feel the cars going by. I mean, it reverberates in your very person when all of those engines and all of that power and all of that noise comes by us. We feel it. Some of you have been to concerts where the bass drums are so loud that you're just shaking with every beat of the drums and, and, and strum of the bass guitar. It feels pretty cool. Wouldn't that be neat for Wilkesboro Baptist Church to have something like that? Some of, you would, some of you, if that was what took place in our worship service, you'd be like, oh my goodness, I've gone to the wrong church. <laughs> I'll tell you something. What took place at Mount Sinai 
some 3,500 years ago, this storm and tempest and lightnings and thunders, the people of Israel, they were in tents. They weren't at homes. They, did, they didn't have a place that they could go for respite. They didn't, couldn't get in a car where the electricity of a lightning strike wouldn't, wouldn't burn up what was around them. I mean, it was frightening and terrible. I just want to remind you, God hasn't changed. The God of Sinai is the same God that we meet in the New Testament. We need to see God for who He really is. And the writer says, that's not the way we've come to God. We don't have to come to God through Sinai. We don't have to come to God through the Old Testament religious system. We don't have to come to God through the rituals and laws and rites of the Old Testament. We come to God a different way. We haven't come this way to God, but we have come. Look at verse 22. You have come to Mount Zion. You have come to the place where God has chosen to dwell. You have come to the city of the living God. The new Jerusalem, he says. The heavenly Jerusalem. In other words, what he's saying is, you haven't come to God by way of Sinai. You've come to God by way of Jerusalem. You've come to God by way of the place where he has chosen to make his presence dwell. And notice the, 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 the descriptions of what that looks like. You've come to innumerable angels and festal gatherings. Think of angels as being mighty warriors with swords. Think about the angel standing at the Garden of Eden. Or think about the angelic messengers at Christ's birth and at Christ's resurrection. Think of angels in glory and in grandeur, and they are. But in this instance, the angels are in festal robes. They are worshiping and celebrating the King of Kings. And guess what, people? That's where we've come to. We've come to God in a place where the angels are celebrating the redemptive glory of Christ. Notice what else he says. And to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Who are the assembly? We are. We're the people of God. The assembly of who? The assembly of the firstborn. We're, we're the assembly of Jesus. Jesus is the firstborn of all, all creation. doesn't mean he was created. It means that he's the, prim, the primary image bearer of God. He is the first of all creation. He is the one to whom we look and the one to whom we follow. He is the firstborn. And guess what, Christian? We are part of the assembly of the firstborn. In other words, every time we gather as a body of believers, we are expressing our praise and worship of Jesus, who is the, the focus of our attention. He is the glory. He is the one to whom we are focusing our, our worship and our adoration. The assembly of the firstborn, where? Enrolled in heaven. You know where the primary experience of our assembly, assembled gathering is going to be? Not here on earth. It's in heaven, and it is where we're going to. Notice what he says, and to God, who is the judge of all. We're going to God. And we might think, as we look around our world, and our world is in chaos and turmoil and all sort of craziness and things that are happening that just kind of are, are, are ludicrous, things that are taking place in our world. And we wonder, when are things going to get fixed and when are things going to be righted and the people who originally read the text, who originally read this from the book of Hebrews, would have been wondering the same things. When is the persecution going to cease? What's going to happen with the Roman Empire, who, who is badgering down on us in persecution and in evil? We haven't come to the emperor. We have come to the God who will judge everything. Did you catch that? He is the judge of all. The God we worship it's not a tribal deity. We, we, we aren't just Christians who are gathering in this congregation today, worshiping God and worshiping our God, and then the Muslims are over there worshiping a different deity, and, and, and he's sort of there too, but, but, and, and then there are other religions. No, the God we worship is the God who judges all. He is the God who every person on planet earth will answer to this God because he is the one true God. Christian, the reason we ought to be encouraged, deeply encouraged as followers of Jesus is because the God to whom we bring praise and adoration is a God who will one day right all wrongs, fix all sinfulness and wickedness because he is the judge of all peoples everywhere. Notice what else he says. We have come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Look around you. Look around you. Take a moment. Look in the congregation. Are we perfect? Not yet. But we will be made so. 
No one will enter into heaven apart from being made perfect by God. We have come to the spirits of the righteous. There's coming a day when God's going to wipe away every desire for sin that indwells your body. There's coming a day when God's going to cleanse and make us so that we can enter into the heavenly worship space. And how does all this happen? It doesn't happen by coming to God through the law. It doesn't happen by coming to God through obedience. It happens by coming to God through Jesus. We have come to God to Jesus. Notice this, the mediator of a new covenant. Jesus gives us access to God and his blood. How does he make that happen? The sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Here's what Jesus does. Jesus gives us access to God the Father. God hasn't changed. He is the same God as the God on the mountain. He is the same God as the God of glory at Sinai. Yet we can come to that God through Jesus Christ because of what? Because he died on a cruel Roman cross. And he sprinkled and shed his blood over those of us that are sinful. That word sprinkling carries with it the idea of a priestly concept. Jesus sprinkles his blood over us and thereby cleanses us and gives us access to God the Father. Folks, we need to see God for who he is and we need to experience God through Jesus Christ. That's the power of the gospel. In fact, that is the explanation of the gospel. That's exactly what the writer's doing. He's telling us God is more glorious and holy than we could ever imagine. And the way we experience God is not through Sinai. It's not through the law and the mechanism of the past. It is through Jesus and Jesus alone. And then what does the writer do? He exhorts us. He he applies it. He shows us how then are we to live as followers of Jesus in light of the fact that we can see God for who he is and in light of the fact that we can experience God through Christ. And that's where we get our next paragraph. He follows it up with three specific applications. The first application is this. We need to hear the one who speaks. Look at verse 25. See to it. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. We're to make sure that we pay attention to the warning words of God. Okay? That's who we're to be. Christian, that, that, that means that you and I need to recognize that when God speaks, we can't change what God says. The warnings in the book of Hebrews are designed so that we as Christians will kind of focus our attention on the God who is in charge. If he's the God at Sinai, if he's the God who speaks, then guess what? There's a warning to us. You and I as Christians, when we read God's word, we obey God's word. We don't have have a right to do anything else. We don't have a right to come to God's word and say, okay, I don't like this part, but I'm I'm just going to ignore it. I don't like it when Jesus said, forgive your enemies. There's some people I don't want to forgive. I'd like to just excuse myself from that application of Scripture. I'm not allowed to do that. We're to see to it that we obey what God says in His Word. I'm not sure I like it when when God says, don't gossip. I was reading this morning in my quiet time about how God doesn't like the deceitful and judges the deceitful. I I don't like that because I find myself... It's easy to not say everything that's true or to shade the truth. Listen, I'm to come to those places in Scripture, not ignoring them because I don't like them, but submitting to them. When God says to us as a gathered congregation that we're to worship Him, whether it's in song or in activity, I'm not allowed to say, I don't like that part. I'm going to ignore that. We're we're supposed to humble ourselves before God's Word and obey what He says. Christian We need to do that when God speaks. God has spoken, He has warned, and He says to us, if we ignore His warning, then we're going to experience His judgment. He said that throughout the book of Hebrews. So we're to hear and heed what God says to the non-Christian. That is a significant warning. If God is the judge of all, then at some point every person will answer to God. You do realize that, right? Every single person on planet Earth is going to stand before God and give an account. And if you're here today and you haven't yet trusted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, notice the text. If we refuse him who warned on earth, we will not escape if we reject and refuse him who warns from heaven. Every one of you in this room is going to stand before a holy God. Every person on planet earth is going to stand before a holy God. And the invitation that God gives us, indeed the warning God gives us is this, don't refuse him who speaks. 
What has he spoken? He's saying you don't have to go through the law to get salvation. You go through Christ and receive forgiveness. That's what God is saying. Indeed, he goes on to say it this way. Verse 26. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. He's making a quote, actually. He's connecting this text of Scripture, this promise, this affirmation of God speaking to the book of Haggai. A small minor prophet, go back into the Old Testament, Haggai was speaking to the returned exiles. So the people of Israel had failed God, they disobeyed God. God sent Babylon to judge them, sent them into exile for 70 years. They came back, and when they came back, they were responsible for rebuilding Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple. And Haggai's message was to the returned exiles who were rebuilding the temple. And he used this phrase, the writer quotes from this phrase, that Haggai used in Haggai chapter 2. Haggai 2 says this, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? In other words, what Haggai is saying to the people of Israel, hey, how many of you were little when you left? In other words, there were some of the people who left as exiles as children, and they had seen Solomon's temple, which, by the way, Solomon's temple was full of glory. Go back and read about what Solomon did in building the temple. He overlaid all of it with gold. It was one of the most spectacular, glorious investments of wealth and, and glory and majesty and a space for God. Solomon's attempt was to say, hey, listen, I'm going to build this temple and I'm going to show off the grandness and the glory and the majesty and the wonder of God. That's what I'm going to do with the temple. But the people of Israel disobeyed God. They experienced God's judgment. What did the Babylonians do? They took all that gold. They took all those instruments, they took all of the elements of worship that were in the temple in Jerusalem, and they carted them off to Babylon as a reflection of judgment. People of Israel were standing there under Haggai's day, and they were hearing that, hey, listen, you need to rebuild the temple. Haggai goes on to say this, verse 6 of Haggai 2, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more, in a little while, the quote from Hebrews 12, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. And he says this in verse 9. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. God says the glory of this house will be greater than the glory of the former house. How can that be? Because the glory of the temple that the exiles rebuilt was not anything in comparison with the gold overlay that Solomon put in its place. It gets to what God was going to do in the temple. Do you realize that the temple that the exiles built is the temple in which Jesus walked? It's the temple in which Jesus brought peace. And what the writer of the book of Hebrews is saying here is God has spoken and saying, I'm going to shake the world. I'm going to shake everything. I'm going to bring judgment about. And he's connecting that to the picture of redemption. What he's saying to us is this, that our hope in God, our listening to God, our heeding his voice is coming to God through the redemption that is only available in Jesus Christ. He connects it to redemption, knowing that we are hearing God's voice and listening to him if we follow Jesus and trust him as our Lord and Savior and let him be our Lord and heed his warning. There's also a connection to the eschatological future vision of what God is going to do. He's going to judge everything. He's going to bring all of the sinful wickedness to the war in the world. He's going to bring it under judgment. And guess what? When he shakes that, we're not going to be a part of the shaking. We're going to be a part of a kingdom that is unshakable. First application is this. We're to hear the one who speaks. Hear God who speaks to us. The second application is that we are to be grateful for an unshakable kingdom. We're to be grateful for kingdom life. Notice the way he describes this. All of these things are going to be shaken. And then in verse 28, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The word shaken carries with it the idea of judgment. It carries with it the idea of God bringing about destruction. So, so all the things that he shakes at that point in the future when God is going to bring about his judgment on the world, all of the things that he shakes are the things that are going to go away. 
They're not going to be there anymore. They're, gonna, they're not going to last. They're going to fall under his judgment, and they're not going to remain. But the things that don't shake are the things that remain. And the kingdom that we are a part of is a kingdom that is unshakable. Our worship team just sang about that. It's a kingdom that can't be shaken. So you and I, as followers of Jesus, are to be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Why are we to be grateful? We're to be grateful uh, for a lot of things that the kingdom brings about. Let me give you a preview. This summer, we're going we're to look at the life of Christians in the kingdom of God in comparison with the kingdoms of this world. You and I look around the world and we see a lot of things that trouble us, that burden us, that bother us. How do we make sense of those things? And how do we live as part of the Christian, Christians in a kingdom that, that is, that in a world that, it, that is full of depravity and wickedness and despair? We're going to spend some time this summer working through that. And one of the kind of foundational truths is that the kingdom of God tethers us to the now and to the forever. What do I mean by the now? What Jesus said when he came on planet earth, his first sermon was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus brought about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not anything less than God's reign through his people today. Now, there's more to, more to come, but it is tethered to the now. Here's what that means. Every time the gospel is preached by a Christian in a church, the kingdom of God is spreading. Every time. When God's word spreads and people come to know Jesus, the kingdom of God is spreading. It's spreading throughout our world. Kingdom of God is God's reign in our world. Reign through the spread of the gospel. Reign through changing hearts and lives and people. Reign in the, in the ordinary affairs of life. And here's the reality. If God can bring about Jesus in the world and bring about our salvation through what Jesus did in human history, and if he can cause that to take place some 2,000 years ago on the cross, his reign is continuing today. The text tells us that we are receiving this kingdom. It's a present tense participle. It means that it is going on now. You and I are receiving the very reign of God in our lives now. It is going on. It is taking place. We are experiencing it if we will continue to follow in God's ways and, and trust that Jesus is in charge. Uh, it also tethers us, the kingdom of God, to the future. There's coming a time when God's going to shake everything in the world and the only thing that lasts is what's a part of his kingdom. Are you listening? The only thing that will last is what is a part of his kingdom. He's going to shake all the world and all the media is going to go away because it's not going to last. He's going to shake the world and presidents and congresses and supreme courts are going to go away because they're not going to last. He's going to shake the world and all the wickedness and depravity of tyrants and dictators and warmongers. It's going to go away because it's not going to last. How about this? He's going to shake the world and cancer is going to go away because it's a part of the things that God's going to judge. He's going to shake the world and Alzheimer's is going to go away because it's a part of the world that he is going to judge. We are a part of an unshakable kingdom. Watch this. I think a lot of the reason why you and I are so stressed and frustrated, and worried and afraid is because we spend far too much of our time thinking about the things that are going to go away and not near enough of our time on the things that will remain forever. We as Christians ought to be the calmest, most at peace people in all of the world. Do you know why? Because we're receiving an unshakable kingdom. Folks, it shouldn't matter to us what suffering we face. It shouldn't matter to us what difficulty we endure. It shouldn't matter to us whether we have silver or gold because God said in Haggai, all the silver is mine, all the gold is mine. I have everything. It shouldn't matter to us what goes on in the world around us. Why? Because we're a part of an unshakable kingdom. I'm going to tell you something. I think some of the reason why you and I do stress and get frustrated is because we're focused far too much on the things that shake. Far too much on the things that are going to go away. Far too much on the things that, that don't really matter at all. And Christian, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. 
that should encourage us. That should build up our hope. That should lead us to do something else. That's the third application. We worship God in reverence and awe. Therefore, let us be grateful. Folks, we ought to be grateful. We ought to be grateful that we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And it ought to lead us to offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and with awe. Third application is this. We're to worship God in reverential awe. We're to give Him glory. Give Him praise. Give Him majesty. Now, that, that language is important. We're to offer to God. That means we're to give something back to God. It's, it carries with it the idea of a sacrifice. It's not like we're, we're sacrificing animals, but it could be giving away financial trust to God. It could be giving away time. It could be giving away effort. In other words, we're to offer things back to God. Are, are you tracking with me? We're to offer to God acceptable, that is, worship that pleases Him. And that word worship carries with it far more than the idea of just the gathered worship experience. It carries with it that we're to offer God service through everything and anything. We're to offer to God acceptable worship. And that means every part of our lives. Why is that? Well, here's what happens. One of the reasons we need the gathered worship experience so much is because when we show up at church, when we sing the praises of God, when we hear them sung, when we read Scripture, when we open up God's Word and God speaks to us through Scripture, when we see God and experience God, here's what happens. We feel better. We have moments where, hold on, I don't have to worry so much. I don't have to fret so much. I don't have to doubt so much. I don't have to stress so much. That happens when we gather as followers of Jesus. Why? Because there's a unique way in which God meets His people in the gathered worship experience. And that ought to be a part of what we do as followers of Jesus. But, watch this, we are a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That kingdom doesn't stop. You don't leave here... And leave God. You leave here and God is with you and the kingdom is with you. And so our acceptable worship of God shouldn't stop at the hour or hour and 15 minutes, depending on how long your preacher is on a Sunday morning. It shouldn't stop when we, when we leave this space. God's with us wherever we are. And so offering to God acceptable worship, the word worship means service. It means we offer to God everything that we are. In other words, everything that we do as a Christian should be an act of worship because God deserves everything that we are. Offering God acceptable worship is acceptable service not only in the gathered experience when we sing and praise and, and open up God's Word, but when we walk out of here and scatter and spread the good news of the kingdom to people who desperately need that. And why do we do that? We do that in reverence and all. Reverence carries with it the idea that we see that who God is. All reminds us that we're worshiping a God we can't even imagine. Why? For our God is a consuming fire. Folks, God hasn't changed. The God on Sinai is not any different than the God that we're worshiping today through Jesus Christ. He's not a bit different. He is the same God. I want you to, so we close our worship service, I want, I want you to go with me in your imagination. Go with me all the way back with the Hebrew people there at Sinai. I want you to imagine that you're there gathered around the mountain. You're not gathered in your homes. The, the best you have are tents. You gather there. You've come out of Egypt. You've experienced God's rescue. You've seen God's miracles. All that's taken place. Now you're at the mountain where you're supposedly meeting God. You're going to hear from God. You're going to hear God speak to you as the people whom He has done signs and wonders and miracles. For weeks He's done that to bring you out of Egypt. You've seen the Egyptian army destroyed by the Red Sea covering them. You've seen the, the, the miracles of the plagues. You've seen all of these things. And now you're at the mountain meeting God. And if that were you and me, maybe we'd want God to be tender. Maybe we'd want God to be... Gentle. Maybe we'd want God to be easy and nice. People of Israel were there. Great storm clouds came over the mountain. A tempest, lightning strikes, thunders that you could feel that reverberate in your very person. Imagine the smoke of a consuming fire at the top of the mountain. 
In your nostrils, you can smell the, the, the burning of dirt and stone and wood. All of that's there. And all of that's there so much that even Moses, who spoke with God face to face, said, I tremble with fear. Folks, God hasn't changed. Our God is a consuming fire. God that we worship is that God at Sinai. God did something glorious and wonderful that day. Where the people of Israel would have been destroyed if they came up on the mountain to talk to God. God invited a mediator up. He asked Moses to come up into the mountain. For 40 days he spent talking to Moses about what the people needed to hear. Moses was a pretty good mediator. Through Moses, the people of Israel got the law and got the sacrificial system. But Moses was an imperfect mediator. For the people of Israel could not be fully and forever redeemed through the work and the words of Moses. God has provided us a better mediator. God is inviting us to worship him as the consuming fire. And he's given us access through Jesus. Folks, the way in we, which we worship God is not through our obedience. It's not through our goodness. It's not even ultimately through our reverence and all. It is through Christ. He made a way possible for you and I to praise and bring glory to the God who is. If you're here today and you have not come to God through Christ, I would beg that today be the day that you trust Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. That you come to the God who is a consuming fire and come to God through Jesus Christ by trusting in Jesus alone to be your Savior. Christian, the worship that we should bring back to God should depend on who He is, not on who we are. Not on our preferences and desires, but on the glories of God, our consuming fire. When we sing our invitation song in a moment, I surrender all. Who are we surrendering all to? Surrendering all to this God who is a consuming fire. May we do so in worship and in truth. Stand with me if you will. Our God, we come to you falteringly, flawed, recognizing, Lord, that our worship is all too often so far short of what you deserve and what you've done to bring about salvation in our own lives. Lord, you are the consuming fire. You are holy beyond measure. You are great beyond imagination. You are terrible in fury and in wrath. And yet, God, you have provided a way into your presence through your son, Jesus. Pray for us, us as the gathered assembly of your people today as we close out our worship service with song and with celebration. I pray that we would do so in truth and in humility and acknowledgement the greatness of what God has done through Christ to bring us into your presence. Lord, I pray for the one or the several who are gathered with us today who do not have a relationship with you, who have not experienced your holiness and your salvation. I pray that you convict them of their sin and show them their need to come to God through you, for you are their judge. You will, they will stand before you. I pray, Lord, that they would come to you through Christ so that in standing before you, they can stand before you in the forgiveness that only Christ can offer. Lord, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us, info at Again, thank you for worshiping with us.